Act, Washington Legislative Advocacy 101. Uh, Washington specific, we're going to be talking about what happens here in Olympia. Obviously, legislative advocacy can, can happen at several different levels of government, uh, but we're going to focus on Olympia as well. Um, so here's the agenda. First, we're going to do the 101. So how a bill becomes a law, this is um, schoolhouse rock level material, maybe a little bit more intense. Um, we, I also want to talk a little bit about the, the, the opposite of that, which is just as important, which is how to make sure a bill does not become a law. Um, then after that, I will take a break and then we will get into everything I just taught you or spoke about. We're going to just rethink it all because uh, we're going to challenge some of these um, perceptions. And then I definitely need to talk about what it's going to look like to legislate during a pandemic and how to undertake legislative advocacy during a pandemic because it's really pre pre presenting some challenges that we've never experienced before, at least in my history. So, great. Um, so what do you need to enact a law? The, there, there are lots of things that you need, but I'm trying, I wanna at least narrow down to three core issues that basic things that you absolutely and totally need without which if you don't have these three things, you're just not gonna have a law. Um, the first is an idea. The second is a champion. And the third is a session. And I'm gonna go through all these three uh, one by one. Um, the idea. So <laughs> if you wanna undertake advocacy, you have to have a goal as to what you're trying to pass. What is your law gonna look like? And you will have a bright, shiny idea. Some people feel blocked um, from um, from undertaking advocacy because they think that you have to actually write the law. You actually have to write the legislative language. And really the idea does not have to be in legislative language. The idea can be as basic as a set of bullet points. Um, it can be, you don't even have to have it written down. It can just be communicated in a phone call. We need to do X or Y or Z. We need to stop the practice of suspending driver's licenses just because you can't pay a traffic fine. Great, that's the idea. We've got an idea, we've got a start. Next, you need a champion. Um, this is a different, different presentation. Um, the champion is, is the sponsor, the person who introduces uh, the bill. There, there cannot be, there has to be a legislator attached to the idea. Sometimes folks have seen that a bill is governor request or attorney general request. Those are requested by the executive branch, by the attorney general. They are not, they do not introduce bills. The only people who can introduce bill are legislators. So you need to have a legislator. Folks also freeze up here and think, goodness, I don't know who my champion, who my sponsor should be. So if you live in Washington, you are represented by someone. Um, so I would go to this website that I've included here on the presentation, um, type in your address and you will find out who your district representatives are. And they can be the start for where you find your champion, for where you find your sponsor. A level of um, above that is to think, what is my issue about? Let's say it's an issue related to, uh, to law and justice. So you look on the legislative website, ledge.wa.gov, and you look at who's on the committee of the Senate Law and Justice or House Civil Rights and Judiciary and find someone and you reach out to them and you reach out to their legislative assistant and say, I have this idea. Um, and that is another way to potentially get your idea to a sponsor, to a person who can turn that idea into a bill that could become a law. The third thing you need is a session. Um, you have to actually introduce your, your, your idea, your bill, your, your sponsor, your champion has to introduce it during a time that the legislative session is active. Um, so some basic, issue, you know, basic things to know about a legislative session is that they are biennial. Um, they are of different timeframes. They always start on the second Monday of January, but on the odd years, they are 105 days. And on the even years, they are 60 days. The reason why there's the difference is that on the odd years, um, you are undertaking the, the creation of the actual two-year biennial budget. It takes more time. So there's more time to develop um, ideas during a longer session. 
I've included a copy or at least a part of a copy of a cutoff calendar. And we'll talk a little bit about cutoffs in a bit. But if you can actually see on this PowerPoint, um, you know, the first day is the second Monday. This, this last year's session started on the 14th. This year's it's on the 11th. And you can actually just go down one through 105. We got down to 63 on this PowerPoint slide, but you've got the, the, the clock starts and the clock doesn't stop until you hit 105. Um, this is different than in other states. Uh, I worked in Georgia for a year and they have a 40 day legislative session, but the legislature can pause the clock. And so legislative days don't, don't, uh, don't get counted during these breaks. Um, this is a much more sort of um, reliable way to, to know this is when we're going to start. And typically this is where we're going to end. Obviously there are exceptions like special sessions, but you've got your 105 days. You've got your, you've got your idea, you've got your legislator, you've got your session. So now how do you make the bill move through the process? Um, once your legislator has the idea, um, they will uh, turn it over to nonpartisan staff to create a bill that will go to the office of the code revisor and actually turn it into legislative language. So you'll have legislative language that will go to a policy committee. Um, a policy committee is where the, the, the actual issue is going to be debated and discussed. Um, the fact that a bill is introduced does not mean that it gets heard. Um, so, so understand, I have a funnel here to show you, this is a process that starts with a lot of bills and ends with few because there are all these ways to make a bill not pass. It's built to not pass. The system is built to kill bills. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But your, your policy issue will be discussed in a policy committee. We'll have typically have two hearings. One is the public hearing where in typical circumstances, people will go to Olympia and will sit down, uh, will sign up and say, I wanna testify on this bill. And let me tell you why it's good. Let me tell you why it has problems. Let me tell you why you shouldn't support it. However, you may go. And that policy committee and that public hearing, the legislators hear from staff and from the public as to why this bill should move forward. Um, after that bill is heard in public hearing, there is an executive hearing where that bill is debated solely among the legislators. So now the public is, can watch, but they don't participate in this process where legislators will say, hey, we should change this bill. Let me propose an amendment. Um, we shouldn't support this bill. We shouldn't move it forward or we should. If you want your bill to pass, you want that policy committee and the executive committee in the executive hearing to actually pass enough, uh, have enough votes to pass it out of committee. It may be amended, may not, but at least it gets out of the policy committee. If the bill has costs money, and most of them do, and if it costs enough money, if it costs, and I'll give you a ballpark, of, you know, over $100,000, it's going to go to a fiscal committee. The fiscal committee in the House is called uh, Appropriations, in the Senate it's Ways and Means. These are the committees that talk about the money. Again, same structure like the policy committee. You've got a public hearing and executive hearing. Um, the public hearing is slight executive session. The, the, the public hearing is slightly different. Now you are not, you can go and testify, but typically those committees do not wanna hear about the substance, about the policy. They wanna hear about the fiscal implications of the bill. So you, if you go and testify in front of a fiscal committee, it's about the money um, and, and, and whether the, the the amount is, is too high, too low, whether, whether it makes sense, what the money is about. You have to sort of focus on those issues. Again, you've got to get those out. You've got to get your bill out of that committee. Funnel narrows. Um, I'm going to just take a quick step here so, you, so we connect the session calendar to these committee hearings. It was called the cutoff calendar. The cutoff calendar, um, it's called cutoffs because at certain points, a bill has to make it past this step or it dies. So after five weeks, there is a policy committee cutoff. If your bill hasn't been heard by the policy committee by that time, your bill is 99% dead. I don't want to talk about the exemptions right now, but it is, that is, that is a, 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 you miss that mark, you're dead. You miss the fiscal committee um, cutoff, which is usually just a week later, your bill dies again. So again, the funnel, the funnel, the funnel, it gets shorter and shorter after fiscal it goes to rules, which is a committee which decides what goes to the floor to get debated. You've got to get your bill out of that committee. It's a little bit more arcane in terms of how to get it out, but you just need a couple of folks on the rules committee to support the idea of your bill getting debated on the floor, then it goes to the floor. So if this is a house bill, it goes to the house floor 
needs to get a majority of folks to vote for it. Again, there's a cutoff, there's a floor cutoff. And if your bill doesn't make it through that cutoff, it's dead again. Great, you've got it through the house or whatever, whatever chamber you started. Now you got to go to the opposite chamber and you've got to do the same thing. You got to go to the opposite chamber policy, you got to go to the opposite chamber fiscal, opposite chamber rules. I'm being repetitive here. And then if the bill has changed in the other chamber, now you've got to reconcile the, the version that passed out of the House, if we're starting in the House, and the version that's a, that has passed out of the Senate. If they don't look the same, they've got to get reconciled. And that is a process which sometimes looks like ping pong, which is the Senate sends it to the House. The House says, you know what? We don't agree with these amendments. We're going to send it back to you and tell you we don't agree, or we're going to recede from or our amendments, or we're going to accept your amendments back and forth, back and forth until the two chambers on the floor level agree that the bill should look the same. And then after that, the legislature delivers the bill to the governor and then the governor signs. As a, as a member of the policy staff for, for a governor, folks often leave this until the end to figure out where the governor is on a bill. And I strongly recommend that you know who the policy advisor is on the issue that you are working on and checking in to make sure that the governor isn't going to take all of this incredible effort that you have built into this bill and kill it with a veto. Um, it happens not often, but it happens enough that it can be incredibly frustrating. Um, so, so check in with the governor staff while you're doing, while you're pushing your idea to make sure that this is not something that is completely anathema to where the governor needs to be. Uh, so that's the, the funnel process. I wanna put in a word to transparency in Washington state. Um, I said this 15 years ago and I'll say it today still, in terms of transparency and being able to follow a bill, the Washington system is, is fantastic. I worked in trying to you know, push federal advocacy for seven years, widely and effectively, um, it is difficult to follow a bill at the federal level. Um, it is difficult to follow the bill, follow bills and track bills in mo most states. But the Washington system is really quite transparent. Uh, on the ledge.wa.gov website, you can see your bills as they look, as they've been amend amended, and on every bill, you'll actually find links to the actual debates. So you can, it'll have a tvw.org uh, website for when the bill was debated in the public hearing and when it was debated um, by, in the executive session. And you can actually go and watch those right away. Everything is accessible. Um, bills are, um, are summarized and the input from the public are put into, set, into committee reports. You'll get those as well. You can get roll call votes. It, it really is quite... Um, trackable um, remotely. You don't have to be in Olympia to track a bill at all. When I was in Georgia, uh, an example is sometimes committee hearings would be announced day of, and they, the only way they'd be announced is they were pinned onto a cork board uh, somewhere in, the, in a corner of the legislative building. Um, that's not transparent. Uh, uh, but Washington is. So uh, that is uh, a great benefit that we have towards, towards tracking, towards legislative advocacy is that level of transparency. Um, like I mentioned, the way to get a bill across is a, is, is a funnel. It is a, is a, it is a bill killing machine as my friend Eric just said in a presentation um, just a couple of weeks ago, and it really is. Um, if you look at some of the statistics, um, I don't know if how 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 quick how easily you can see this, but you'll see on the blue lines are the number of bills introduced in odd years, and then just how many bills pass. So percent passed, um, you're down. You know you you have a you have a you know two thousand bills introduced, and less than five hundred um, um, passed. And remember, this is in a situation in 2019, and most of these years. Um, where it's one party control. And it's still the idea that there's one party control will make getting bills across much easier is, um, that's not true. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, the system is built to kill bills. Um, how do you kill a bill? 
even in um, um, even if, for example, you the you have a friendly legislature, you are going to see bills proposed that or start moving that actually, in my world, that actually harm people in poverty. And so I have to work just as quickly to get a bill killed. There are different ways to do it. So one, you always recognize that the time is on your side. Um, you have those cutoffs to work on. So if a bill becomes too complicated or too divisive and the stakeholders haven't come together, it's possible that that bill will not make it to the cutoff, will, will, will be delayed and won't get voted on and will die through a cutoff. There are other strategies that you can use as well. I mean, you can potentially love a bill uh, too much. You can add extra things to a bill that will bring in new stakeholders that will gum it up. You could add things to a bill or make sure that the bill is too expensive to get out of a fiscal committee. Um, and, and you can ask key legislators to not actually hear a bill at certain levels. So you can you know, check in with the rules chair. Maybe it doesn't get out of rules. Maybe you can check in on the floor if you have, um, if you know folks in leadership to say, this, is a, this bill isn't going to work um, and we need to get it, uh, we, we need to not have it heard. So there are different layers to do this. And as has happened to me, um, there is a bill that suddenly starts no idea that it's moving in a, in a fast session, particularly in a 60 day session that makes it to the house floor without me even knowing. And by the time I get to, to understand that the bill is actually problematic, it may have made it out of the house. Um, but you have that whole other chamber to work with as well. The process is made for various opportunities for you to be heard as to whether a bill should move or not. And you should know when those op opportunities arise. And I've had to do this a couple of times is move over to the Senate side. Obviously, I think that the, we don't wanna waste legislators time. Um, and, 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 and if you can and identify a bill that's problematic early, then make sure that early on in the process, the legislators who need to know that it's problematic um, are there. To, uh, to hear from you. So, so that's the beginning of this conversation. This is how a bill passes and how a bill doesn't pass. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Oh, I'm not new share. Pause share, does that work? Uh, I don't know how to do that. Okay, stop share, great. Gonna go back here. Um, do anybody have, do, do we have questions now about the process? Um, do you wanna either put your questions in chat or raise your hands I, open to either? I'm gonna have some water. All right, here we go. One from Murph. When there are so many bills, how do you even start to track them? <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, describing my, my nightmare every, every time Jan the, the second Monday of January comes around. Um, every day, the legislature puts out a list of bills that were introduced that day by um, legislators. And you'll have the bill number and you'll have a brief description of what that bill does. That brief description is really often not helpful. And what you need to do is actually, if it is in any way, you could check. Also, it's really important that that list will tell you where the bill was referred to in terms of policy. So if it was referred to, oh boy, I'm gonna give you an example and then I'm gonna blow it up. Um, if it was re referred to transportation, you would think typically that that wouldn't be an issue that I'd work on since transportation is not on our priority list. But then of course, when the bill that made it so much easier for tow truck operators to, to tow vehicles where people are sheltering in those vehicles and get rid of all their personal property, um, that one sort of caught us by surprise because it was referred to transportation. So really you have to have um, folks who are able to look at every bill. I look at every bill, but I do not understand every bill. And so I'm fortunate to have a team of folks at CLS who will, who have broken up what subject matter they'll look at in terms of bills. 
also, and I want this is very important, the partnership with other legal aid organizations to also look so their housing advocates, the housing task force that's convened by the Northwest Justice Project can look at bills related to housing and see if they are problematic or helpful or if we, you know, if they need if they actually harm the people they work for. Um, so folks and, and family law as well, some of the areas where other partners can look at they're 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 there. Um, and so, so the only way to track bills, that many number of bills, the 2000 that typically come in every odd session is to have, you know, a team of folks able to look at them. Um, all right, I've got some more questions, exciting. Um, Tristan, when choosing a champion, does it matter if they're a Senator or representative, will all bill goes through both chambers? Fabulous question. Um, so, the answer is it doesn't matter, but if, I, if I'm gonna give you a strategy, and this is only applies in every year other than 2021, and I'll get into this in a second. Um, typically the strategy is get your bill introduced with a companion. So you have a, 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 the same exact language introduced by a representative and by a Senator. The reason why is regardless of how expert you are as an advocate, as a lobbyist, however you want to describe yourself, things happen and bills that seem to be moving at some point get derailed for some reason. They run out of time to, to address it on the floor and they've got other bills that are ahead of it. And all of a sudden the bill that you thought was going to shoot through your chamber dies on the floor. It's helpful. That's why you have, the, you have your second shot here with your, with, your, with your companion on the Senate side. So strategically, the answer is if you can, Get the bill introduced in both chambers and track and push the bill in both chambers. Um, I'll get into why that's a problem in 2021 in a bit, but let's just, uh, generally, that's what you want to do. That, that, there doesn't matter which, the answer is try to get both, all right? Uh, Randy, what happens when similar bills are introduced? So yes, yeah, so, so in that situation at some point, like let's say there are exact companion bills, at some point there will be a decision amongst the legislators, which will be the vehicle, which will be the bill that will actually move through. Maybe they don't want to spend the time pushing both bills if they've got one going. So there'll be a decision that this will be the bill that we'll work on. What we'll see, um, uh, likely see maybe in this upcoming session is se separate different bills that don't look the same, but touch on the same issue like uh, on, on legal financial obligations or on uh, uh, earned time. Um, at some point, those bills, they, they're not companions. They can move at their own pace. But at some point, again, legislators will say, this is the vehicle and we're just gonna ignore this other one for now. We're gonna decide to focus our energy on the way this particular bill works. <clears throat> All right, Lisa. What's the latest time before during session that you need to have a champ? Ah, the latest time. When is the best and worst timing? All right, Lisa, love the question. I'm gonna answer it as soon as I finish questions because that's my next conversation about, about timing um, because you're, you're on to something. I, I, I'll give you my short answer and then we'll do it a little bit longer later. Um, if you think that, you know, just introduced is January 11th comes around the second Monday, you find a legislator then, and, you know, a couple of weeks later get introduced, um, you're hampering your chances of getting your bill across. You're already way too late. Okay. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And Janet flags in the chat that the website does have a nice tracker to keep, to keep, to set up for yourself for the bills that you're interested in following. Definitely. Another thing that I, uh, even at the federal level, the Washington state bill tracker is actually much more user friendly um, where you can type in the number of bills that you wanna track and it will actually notify you when the bill moves from committee to committee. Um, when things change, you'll get a notification, which is awesome. You can get them specific for your a, a particular bill right on the bill page. It'll say, send me an email notification so you can track it that way. And then there's actually a bill tracking system where you can type in multiple bills to use as well. All right. Randy, why would a bill ever take away funding from another that's helping a community in poverty? Are there protections we can put in these bills? <laughs> um, I appreciate the question. I think you're absolutely um, right. Um, the, the, the problem, the reality is there are separate stakeholders with se separate interests. So uh, for example, 
um, I often have to work on issues where the Washington Collectors Association is not particularly supportive of the policy proposal. So reducing interest on consumer debt could be helpful to people who are, who are struggling under the burdens of debt. But by reducing that interest, um, I'm actually hurting the pocketbook of, um, uh, of collection agencies who their, their business model is, is, is collecting those bills. When we are trying to push bills, for example, that make it harder for the agricultural industry to retaliate against workers, that actually impacts the bottom line of the agricultural industry. So they are stakeholders involved in that conversation and we need to be persuasive as to why the legislature needs to act in that situation. Um, as you'll see in a bit, um, that is challenging, particularly when you know well-funded um, industry uh, can bring out a lot more, uh, can put a lot more resources into the legislative advocacy than some of us. And that's just the reality. Thank you for those questions. We'll have one more shot here um, at the end of this presentation. Um, and so think through some more. All right. Um, now I'm going to go back to my desktop here. There's my break. And now I'm going to share that. And here we are again. Awesome. So this is rethinking the 101. We've learned a few things in the last 20 minutes. Let's unlearn them. What do you really need to enact a law? Okay, we have an idea. Okay, you think you have an idea. Really, in reality, the idea that you have some sort of fancy idea that's come that, that, that is new and bright and everybody's going to be interested in, it's already been discussed a thousand times before. There's been a lot of different ideas on this issue. There's been a lot of conversations on it. Don't assume that you're starting from scratch. There's lots of history in the legislature and the legislature knows what's been going on and understands all the stakeholders involved. Um, your idea is not as perfect as you think it is, and you need to have some sort of sense of where it comes from or how it's been discussed in the past. Um, the legislature, regardless of how folks want it to work, is a very incremental body, particularly, and I'll speak to Washington, um, the legislature has typically aimed to move bit by bit. So it's building on prior successes. So your idea is likely built on a prior policy change and you need to be aware of that as you're making this presentation. Maybe, for example, you have this idea that we should automatically exempt um, certain funds from bank account garnishment. Um, and we're gonna be working on that. The, the industries, the debt buyers, the collection agencies will say, hey, you just worked on this two years ago. Legislators tried to do this um, or le legislators made this change. They've already done changes and the industry has been, you know, has had to react to them and they don't have enough time to react to this new set of changes. So we're gonna go and tell legislators that, you know, it's too soon to tackle this again. You need to know that and you need to be able to contest that. Uh, if you think the change is important, is the change is valuable. So you need to be a really attuned to where your idea really comes from and how it plays into um, the history of the work in the legislature. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm trying to be polite here. Um, the champion, when I say you do need a sponsor, but all sponsors are not the same, okay? Sometimes, you know, the ideal legislator is one who is passionate about the issue and is willing to work the bill, which means willing to find every leverage opportunity to make a bill move forward. And we do have legislators like that. Um, and they are um, incredibly helpful. And we're very lucky and fortunate when we have sponsors like that. But sometimes they, they can't be that way. Let's at least say sometimes sponsors have 20 other bills that they're working and of different levels of priority. And sometimes they cannot work those bills in the same way. So you cannot depend on your sponsor to work your bill. You can at minimum depend on your sponsor. If you get a sponsor to drop your bill, to, to introduce your bill, great. That's, you could, I mean, without that, you're not gonna get the bill across anyway. So you have a sponsor who does that. Anything else, right? You have to approach as gravy. Um, 
because there is no guarantee that your sponsor will be you know, as effective a champion as you'd like them to be. Um, legislative advocacy does not work that way. Um, the session, and this goes to, I think it was Lisa's question, does not start the second Monday of January. The session started weeks ago. It's just not official. When does session really start? Session starts when legislators want to start talking about the next session's bill. Session could start the day after the last session. You could have interim meetings with stakeholders, um, with legislators, with champions, right at the end of session. Now, some legislators, and I just got an email, I got an email like this when I was trying to reach out to somebody in August, they said, you know, get back to me in December. Legislators are supposed to be part-time citizen legislators. They don't, this is not a full-time job. They're not paid as full-time legislators and they may have other jobs that they need to work on. Um, so they don't have the capacity to play the role of legislator, but some do. And folks need to be aware of who the key legislators are and what their capacity is during the interim. Um, and that will make work a lot easier. It is really helpful to have a legislator um, engage during the interim to pull together stakeholder meetings to get bill language work through so that you are prepped so that right now, as my friend Paul just called this, the December crunch is upon us where everybody's on this, folks are actually um, already prepared. They've done their work. They've recognized that sessions you know, could have started um, for some people in June. I mean, for some legislators, so that you the work the work is important, and there is legislative advocacy to that occurs throughout the interim. I would say that the clock really starts ramping up, uh, Lisa. In um, I would say when school starts um, after Labor Day, really, really um, starts ramping up. So you 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 could, should be working then to get a you know at least bill language worked out. Um, now. You can introduce a bill in the, you know, in the first couple of weeks of session. session. Um, so long as you are know that you are have lost some time to get a bill scheduled on a, for a committee hearing and to get voted out of committee. Sometimes, and this happened last year on a number of bills, there was such a push to introduce a, a number of bills that there were just no slots left for committees to actually hear bills. And so people with great ideas, but the ideas were late, didn't, couldn't even get a hearing on one of our bills that happened. Um, so we just ran out of time to even get the bill heard. Uh, so keep it in mind, in terms of timing, session has started. It started a while ago. Um, and and, and don't, don't just look at this session calendar and think, boy, this is, this is what I need to follow. Um, I've had lots of discussions with colleagues about the tools that really matter in, in legislative advocacy. And, and there's a reason why people are more effective. I'm gonna just take a little break here. Oh, oh, very distracting. Hi, okay, go down. Um, so uh, uh, the, the tools that really matter as I was, as the, it's hard to actually be a lobbyist when you're not in Olympia to lobby and advocate for a bill when you are not present. And why is that? Because so much activity happens informally and you have to recognize the informal nature of session, which is uh, there's Senator Peterson walking to his car as I'm walking by him and I have this thing that I need to make sure that he gets scheduled. So I grab him and say, Senator Peterson, please, could you get this scheduled? Or is this bill gonna make it out of committee? Where do you think? The informal hallway conversations are the stuff that legislative advocacy is made out of. And, 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 and legislators, as they're part-time legislators, often will, 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 will reward familiarity, will remove, oh, here comes Antonio, he's been, you know, we've worked together on other things. Um, let's talk about this thing. So it's not just some random stranger approaching them. So, so in-person access is crucial um, expertise in an issue because there are these bills where you know, le legislators just may not have the, 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 the technical understanding of a certain issue. And so they appreciate expertise that's brought to the table. So, so this is all sort of leaning towards one of the tools that matters is, is, is lobbyists. Um, 
lobbyists bring that familiarity. I, I, I lovely neighbor who's been doing this work for, for 40 years. The, people know who he is. Um, that has the expertise in the issue, there's familiarity. There's also sort of showings of power. So you can show power by bringing a lot of people to the legislature and that, that's important. Uh, some lobbyists can help show it via making sure that a certain legislator gets a campaign donation. I mean, these things um, always play and, and, and I think that we have longer and deeper conversations about how to address this problem because this really does impact how um, how law should be made. I think how how people who aren't who don't have access to the those levers of power still have the capacity to actually effectuate change. Um, Here's a familiar site for me in, in, in terms of doing policy advocacy for Columbia Legal Services. It involves one person, Andrea Schmidt, our um, you know, incredibly talented attorney who understands so many issues related to farm worker employment, one legislator, one legislative staff person, and eight different agricultural lobbyists, agricultural industry lobbyists, you know, arguing as to why what we're trying to do is going to hurt the industry and shouldn't happen, shouldn't move forward. That that disconnect, that 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 inequality of arms exists throughout the work, um, and you just have to. <laughs> we can't change that in the in the short term. You have to recognize that it exists. You have to figure out how to uh, mitigate it, how to potentially address it, and you can't ignore it. The idea that you could run a bill that could impact an industry and the industry is not going to know about it is naive. Um, so one thing I like to do is actually reach out to the industry early and saying, this is happening. We're going to work this bill. Let's have the conversation. We're not going to get to consensus on a lot of stuff. Fine. But at least I, you know, the, have the conversation. So it's not happening on the fifth week of session when all of a sudden the tool that's really available to those lobbyists who are really smart about this stuff say, we're just going to delay this process and say the stakeholders haven't reached consensus. We're not going to, we can't do this in time. And suddenly your bill hasn't made its cutoff and it's dead. That happens a lot. It's a tool. The lobbyists, lobbyists know how to use these tools. Um, and they are just a, a key part of this conversation. They are not um, ignoring their role is, like I said, is naive. One thing that's actually quite helpful, again, in terms of transparency is going to the website <laughs> Uh, pdc.wa.gov, and you can see everybody who lobbies, who's registered as a lobbyist, you can see who their clients are, you can see how much they're paid, you can see what issues they've worked on, and who they're reaching out to. It's public, it's transparent, and it's a tool um, that I'm still trying to think through how best to use in terms of pushing, making this um, access to legislative advocacy a little bit more equitable. Those are bigger and longer, more systemic conversations, but I, I think it's important to recognize the tools that matter. Okay, um, I'm going to actually stop sharing because I want to talk about legislating a pandemic, but we don't need to stare at this slide all, the, all this much. So 2021 is going to present some amazing challenges in terms of how to run a legislative session virtually. Um, it pre presents a challenge in terms of how to get public input. It presents a challenge in terms of how to manage time. Um, typically, it, you know, during a regular session, if you want to comment on a bill, you walk into the committee hearing, there's a little computer terminal up there. You say, on this bill, I'm signing in as pro, and yes, I want to testify as to the bill. You can't do that in Zoom. Um, you've got to have a lot more preparation. And there's just going to be a, a challenge of time, and time is a okay. I'm, there, the time is a massive challenge. Um, all hearings are going to be virtual, at least as far as I understand. There's going to be some Senate in-person work, but there's not the public is not going to be allowed in the legislative building. And in terms of accessing lobbyists, all that informal access, the hallway access, the <laughs> parking lot access, that has not going to be happening. Folks are going to be legislating potentially from their, you know from their homes. Um, and so there needs to be a reality, there needs to be there, a recognition that there isn't just, there isn't going to be, because of these logistical challenges, there isn't gonna be enough time to hear the number of bills that are typically heard. 
the number of bills is going to get reduced by a significant amount. What's happening already is legislators are killing bills because they don't, they don't have the time to do, recognizing that they don't have the time to hear them all. They don't have the time to have the committee hearing, the executive hearing, the floor debate. I don't even know how you're gonna do floor debates. Um, um, and it's gonna be interesting to watch. Um, procedural, procedural challenges on the floor. What happens if someone's technology breaks down? Does the vote count? I, it's just, it's mind blowing how different it's gonna be. Um, in terms of substance, uh, legislators, the, the, the word is out. If your bill costs money, uh, it's less likely to be heard. If your bill isn't pre-negotiated, it's less likely to be heard. If your bill isn't in one of the core four issues, and that's uh, racial justice, COVID, economic stability, and climate change. If it's not in that world, it's less likely to get heard. If it's a companion bill, they don't want companion bills this year. They don't want you introducing two bills because they don't have the time. It's not going to get heard. If it's a message bill, which is a bill that folks introduced to organize around, but it really is never going to pass, it's less likely to get heard. And so that is a, it's a major shift as to what, uh, what the, 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 the world of substance is going to be like in Olympia. While it is a challenge, it is also an interesting opportunity because, as I mentioned, with all that, you know, why why people why lobbyists come down here and buy houses and just live here for three months a year so they can go to their breakfast meetings and their dinner meetings and do that hallway access? It's all gone this year. Does that open the door for a more sort of equitable equitable access to legislators? Legislators now instead of you know. Um, instead of catching, and I'll say for myself, instead of being able to catch a legislator in a hallway in one of these legislative buildings, um, I have to set up a meeting time and it has to be on Zoom and you know, and it's a specific time and it becomes a little bit more trackable, a little bit more formal. Those legislative calendars also, just so you know, are publicly disclosable. So they're um, uh, an opportunity to have a sense more clearly who legislators are talking to. Of course, there's still a cell phone and a lot of folks are recognizing that the way to make things work during a legislative session that's virtual is cell phone access. Um, so, so getting legislative cell phones might be helpful as well, just to get better, to have as, as close to informal access as you can get. Okay, that's legislating through a pandemic. Um, I, it, is, it is unknown. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how it's going to work out. I'm a little worried. I don't, you know, I don't know how it's going to impact the, the bills that we're going to be working on. Um, it is going to be an interesting experience. It's going to happen. There's going to be a legislative session. It's just going to look like none other. Um, all right. I want to stop there. I'm going to get a drink. This is time for questions. Uh, if you want to put them in the chat or if you want to just raise your hand, I think I can unmute you. Thanks, Lisa. What if any type of legislation is not allowed to be considered in this short session? There are no restrictions. Uh, and, and thank you for asking that. Um, um, typically, if you are looking for doing work that's budget related, that's particularly related to, to, to fiscal issues, to you know, some sort of um, requirement to fund a particular program, you really want to be doing it in the budget year, the odd numbered year, because that's when the bigger conversations around big budget ticket items are. If you want to create, for example, uh, an unemployment system that addresses the, 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 the need of folks who are not eligible for the current unemployment system due to their immigration status, that's a big ticket item. Or if you want to extend health care uh, coverage, state health care coverage, to, to undocumented immigrants up to the age of 26. These are both proposals that are out there. Those are big ticket items. Those should happen in the budget year and are much less likely to be heard in the supplemental year where the, only the supplemental budget is discussed. Um, so, so that's a strategy question. Um, there's not a restriction. So you can go forward and introduce um, what you want in either session. Typically, strategically, I would say recommend 
start at the beginning of a two-year biennium. You know, we are starting from scratch in 2021. We're starting with zero bills. But once that legislative session is over, the 105 days, those bills just sort of, they all sort of go back to the beginning. And you're going to, you don't start from absolute scratch. You start from some level of work in that second year. So if you're looking for a multi-year strategy, start on the first year of a biennium, okay? Um, I did just on mentioning budgets uh, real quickly. Um, um, budget advocacy is a little different. You don't go through your policy committee. Uh, strategically, you wanna know who, uh, you wanna have a champion on the budget writing team. So who's typically folks who are typically on appropriations and ways and means or on leadership and have them be the champion for a certain uh, you know, budget proviso that you wanna include into the budget. That's the strategy for budget issues. Um, and, and I, I, I want to make sure, um, that I catch you to, to make sure that you have, I'm going to type in my email address. Um, a lot of this work is like I mentioned is it's impossible to do by ourselves. Um, so, um, if you catch a bill that seems uh, problematic and want to talk about it, reach out to me. I'm happy to, if you want to. You know, if you're interested in tracking bills, we can talk about how to make that work. Um, um, I think this is a collaborative effort, collaborative effort, particularly in the access to justice community, considering the inequality of arms. Um, a collaborative, um, constructive effort uh, where we're all rowing in the same direction, it's probably necessary. I think the way, the, 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 the most disappointing moments I've had in terms of legislative advocacy is when I see folks all around a good idea, but not gelling and having the full consensus. And so they're working in their different directions because their opponents are organized and collaborative and they're, they're working together to kill that bill that is a good bill. And getting that sort of level of consensus and collaboration is really important in legislative advocacy. You can't do it alone. Uh, space for a couple more questions. I think then I will stop there. Like I said, I've got, you've got my email address. Um, Murph, anything to close with or are we good? Maybe what is the big ticket item this year that we're working on as a community? Oh goodness. <laughs> um, so, so you will just let me, let me at least flag. Thanks. Uh, it, uh, we will have our legislative priorities for Columbia legal services placed uh, on our website, hopefully by next week, we've got them finalized at least uh, in terms of the, the general priority issues. I do think that there are a number of big ticket items um, like um, where we're, we're going to be partnering with other organizations, like for example, creating this, this, this unemployment-like system for, for workers who aren't eligible for federal unemployment. But at the same time, we're dealing with the reality of a $4 billion, $4 billion budget deficit um, and legislators saying that if the bill costs money, it's less likely to move forward. I do know very much, I mean, clearly from what legislators have said is policing reform is really high on their list. They're gonna get that done. They're gonna do work on climate change and obviously need to address economic recovery post pandemic and during pandemic. So there are, those are going to be the big ticket items. The question is, where do you find the space to push things beyond that? And removing the ban on folks who are undocumented first. So could you just say that real quick? Oh, absolutely. So one of the issues that we're gonna be working on is, is the Office of Civil Legal Aid actually currently is prohibited from issuing funds to programs that provide services to undocumented immigrants. It's sort of a remnant of a of a, a following a federal statute that I think is is grounded and really is an anti farm worker anti Mexican advocacy from the 70s uh, at the federal level and it's just an ugly piece of of, of current um, law that needs to get removed. Um, so we're going to work to remove that exclusion so that money from the Office of Civil Legal Aid can go to programs regard who they serve regardless of who they serve regardless of their immigration status. Thanks for flagging that, Chach and, and Murph. All right, folks, I'm reachable. Uh, I really appreciate you spending this hour with me. <laughs>